Hi, good evening. Hi. Good to break bread. Thinking about Revelation chapter 18, the fall of Babylon. And we'll show, I hope, by the end of this, the relevance of all this to what we're here really to do, which is to break bread in memory of the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you believing, Father, that you are there and that the Lord Jesus is there and that he was here and suffered and died for our sins and truly rose again and ascended to your right hand and is now Lord of Lords and King of Kings and governing and manoeuvring the, the nations towards that final end when at last he shall return, and at last all sin and wickedness shall finally be no more, when at last there shall be no night there. Heavenly Father, we long for that day, and we really pray that you will hasten it in its time, when at last we shall eat and drink with him whom we love, again at his table in his kingdom. And Father, what we do now in taking this bread and this wine is our little acting out of that wonderful day that we have set our hearts upon, when at last he shall again drink of the fruit of the vine with us in his Father's kingdom. Father, that is our hope. We are on your side, completely in our hearts, despite the weakness of our flesh, but we are totally with you, and not with this world. We are of Zion, and not of Babylon. Help us, Father, and confirm us in that conviction and in that identification that we have chosen to make. Father, in our own weakness, in our own weak little way, we have all staked our lives and our hearts on that, that we are on your side and not with this world and not with Babylon. Heavenly Father, please strengthen all your children who are suffering, who are apparently feeling powerless before the strength of that which oppresses them. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that that wonderful hope might burn brightly for every single one of us and that we might realize that actually we are already more than conquerors through him that loved us. Heavenly Father, strengthen us then and strengthen every one of your children in whatever situation they're going through in the apparent obscurity of our lives. We pray that you will strengthen us and guide us towards the end when at last your dear son shall return. Please be with us through all our suffering, through all that we have been through and the results of that that we feel in our lives and our minds to this day and that which is yet to come. We pray that through all of it, Father, we truly might be more than conquerors through him that loved us, which we're now going to remember. For his sake. Amen. Well, you may wonder what the fall of Babylon in Revelation 18 has quite got to do with the, uh, the bread and wine. Well, I hope by the end that will become a little bit more apparent. But just as for starters, this Babylon, however you want to interpret it, I'm not going to be caught up with, with what Babylon is. Clearly, we are Zion. We are Jerusalem, which is from above. And Jerusalem or Zion and Babylon are the two cities in conflict with each other. We are the bride of Christ, the virgin waiting for the Lord's coming. She is the whore. She is the prostitute sitting on the back of the beast of Babylon. And she is drinking a cup of wine. Okay, And she's giving this cup of wine to other people to drink. We've been reading about that here. But she is given a cup of wine to drink. Of course, this whole chapter is alluding to the passages in Jeremiah about the historical Babylon. She was given a cup of wine of the Lord's anger to drink, of his condemnation, and she drank it and was destroyed. And that's why, verse 3, you read about the wine of the anger of her fornication. Idea being that as she was there in her gaudy apparel on the back of the beast drinking wine, she was actually drinking her own condemnation. You see, the cup of wine was the symbol of condemnation from the Lord. And we're told that she's going to be given this uh, cup to drink in the cup, uh, verse 6, in which she mixed, mixed for her a double portion. So, she drinks the wine in her debauchery, in her arrogance, thinking that I, uh, I shall be eternal and I, uh, 
I, I shall never be deposed from my glory. There she is, drunk, basically drinking this, this wine. But actually, that is the wine of her own condemnation. That is the cup of condemnation. Well, of course, this connects, doesn't it, with 1 Corinthians 11, that Paul says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And he warns us not to eat and drink condemnation to ourselves, not discerning the Lord's body. The idea, therefore, is that the cup of wine is a double symbol. It is, as he says in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? This is the cup of blessing, but it is a double symbol. It is also the cup of condemnation. And that is why, inevitably, we examine ourselves, not, I think, necessarily making a little mini list of, you know, a few points we need to improve on, well, that is not, that is no bad thing, probably. But <clears throat> I'm saying that we are brought to a T-junction here, to a T-intersection, where it's to the right or to the left. We can't flunk out of this. We can't say, oh, well, no, I resign. Well, that's... Mm. You can't resign from God. You can't resign from Jesus unless you don't want salvation. So we take this cup, but it is a double symbol. This is a double symbol. It can mean our condemnation, in which case as we drink it. We drink condemnation to ourselves, or it is the cup of blessing which we bless. So th this whole breaking of bread thing brings you up to the T intersection that actually I have to make a conscious election in this life, to the right or to the left, to my eternal condemnation or to my eternal blessing. And that's no bad thing, to realize that there is a seriousness about life, that we face the ultimate issues and we face those issues head on, looking right into the eye of the tiger, that at the day of judgment before which we shall all appear, let us be clear, cannot write a letter of resignation, get out of it. We shall all appear there and go one side or the other, sheep or goats, right or left. And yet that choice is now. We make the answer now. That is the point. Now is the time to decide. And what do you want to do? You want to go to the right or to the left? I want to go to the right. Okay, so that we take the cup of blessing, but we live our lives aware that in the end, all the multitude of choices that we appear to have come down to this. Come down basically to a choice for or against. To the right or to the left, as the Lord himself taught. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. He brings us right up there. That Look, <laughs> there is no third path. This is where the idea of purgatory uh, in the Catholic Church, of, well, if you... Not a total sinner, but you're not a total saint. Well, yeah, there's a third way. Oh, wow, how we all wish that were true. Problem is, it's not true. The Bible says nothing about that. Actually, the very opposite. It keeps talking about two ways and only two choices. All the agony we might go through over this decision, should I do this, should I do that? It gets simpler, I think, as you mature spiritually because you see that <clears throat> the actual issues may not be so important but it is to the right or to the left. Am I for him or against him? I am for him in all my weakness, but I am for him in the end. So, <coughs> one thing I, I'd want to focus on is God's grace to Babylon. I think we would be misreading this to think, oh, yeah, you know, Babylon, evil Babylon, yeah, it's going to be judged, and uh, yeah, we're all like cheering that uh, she gets what she deserves and so forth. Well, if you look back at the Old Testament basis for this, it is the fall of Babylon in Jeremiah 51. You read there, 51 verse 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Wail for her, take her balm for her pain, if so be she may be healed. Babylon's fallen. Hey, get us some medicine. That's what Jeremiah 51 is saying. And here, same thing, quoting from here, Babylon is fallen. It is fallen, but maybe we could heal her. It seems to me then that this is absolutely, it, it, it's not as if this is 1159. Right, Babylon, 
your time is up now. It's almost up. It's 11.59 at 12.00. Your judgment comes. It's 11.59. Repent. This is 12.01. This is grace itself. This is living after midnight, if ever. Because Babylon is fallen, but he hears a voice, come out of her. My people, come out of her. She's fallen. You think, well, has she fallen or not fallen? She is fallen. She has become. Verse 2, a habitation of demons, refuge of unclean spirits, refuge of wild animals and scary birds and so on. So this has happened, but come out of her. It is, I'm talking about an 11th hour appeal. It's actually after 11.59. This is God's grace. And I think you see that grace when you, you look at the whole of Revelation together. Because in chapter 11, a tenth part of the city falls. Why not just scribble the, the lot of them in one fell swoop? You know, just throw some fire bolts down and, and scribble the lot. No, the tenth part of the city falls in chapter 11. Why that? And the chapter 11 is definitely talking about the last days. It's clear from the context there. Why does the tenth part of the city fall? <laughs> to try to encourage the other 90% to repent. That's the idea. And likewise, in chapter 14, we're told that she's to be given a cup that was not diluted. Why mention that? I think the idea is that, look, if she'd have repented earlier, look, the cup of judgment could have been diluted a bit, but didn't want to. Whereas here, the judgment is even worse. In the cup, verse 6, in which she mixed, mixed for her a double portion. So, she's repaid double. Why does the final judgment of her get worse and worse? I think it's because she is given these desperate last moment opportunities to repent. And even when time is up, come out of her, my people. <clears throat> she is fallen. Yeah, she's a habitation of wild animals. But come out of her. You have that, that this absolute grace of God all the way through towards Babylon. And, you know, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He has no pleasure in judging people and condemning people. He is a saviour. And, and that is exactly what the Lord said, that I came not to judge, I, I came to save, I did not come to condemn you, I, I came to save you. And, and that is most definitely the basic characteristic of the Father and Son. And we all have this niggling doubt, even I who say, by God's grace I'm sure that if the Lord comes now, I will be saved. If I die now, I will be saved, by grace. We all, despite having that definite belief, of course we have a niggling, I say doubt, is that the word? We have this niggle that I am a sinner. I'm a serious sinner. I have not responded and do not respond to his love and grace as I should. Way off. And that niggles. And it is appropriate, as man stands before God, that he doesn't stand before God, that he bows the knee. That is appropriate. That is not an excuse for lack of faith on my part, your part, lack of faith in salvation or in the cross of Jesus and what he achieved. No, I just think that is appropriate, that we do have that feel. But, <clears throat> of course, that niggle can get too big and drive out faith that I shall be saved. And what you see here in this whole thing about the judgment of Babylon is God showed so much grace and will show so much grace to Babylon because he wants to save her. At least he wants to save somebody out of her. Even when it's not even 11.59, when it's 11.59 she was told back in chapter 14, you know, that she must repent. Um, you've got all those passages there in Jeremiah that, uh, well, let's try and heal her, although she has fallen. But despite all that, even at 12.01, living after midnight, she is still given some opportunity. Well, how's that for a God who loves to save? Even of his worst enemies. I mean, Babylon is painted here quite rightly as the worst. 
And even, even with her, he wants to save. Now, how about you and me? Well, we are sinners, but we are Babylon. Let's get it right. We are weak. That's the problem. We're weak. Right? He wants to save. And of course, that is the simple message of the cross of Jesus, that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me while I was yet a sinner. And God, in that sense, commended his love toward us as if it needed any commendation. But in the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So this is what we're here to remember. The essentially saving nature of the Lord Jesus and, and, and of God. That they want to save. You know, come to me, the Lord said. I'm humble. I love that. I'm of a humble heart. I'm a humble guy. Come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to me. I'm humble. I'm not arrogant. I'm humble. I am meek and lowly in heart. You know, that's who he is. And Jesus Christ the same yesterday when he said those words, when he was on this earth. Today, the one with whom we have to do, and forever, the Lord whom we shall meet at the day of judgment. So, there is, however... The idea amongst some, and I think it was particularly with the guys who translated the Bible, that actually the day of judgment is a day of gloating over the punishment of wicked people, and we shall all gloat over Babylon, and yay, bash and smash him and the rest of it. It's getting on for 40 years ago now, when as a teenager I attended classes about Revelation and this sort of thing. And um, we were told, teenagers, you know, yeah, it's going to be great. Guys, you know, we were young, you know, teenagers, boisterous and the rest of it. And it's going to be great when, when the Lord comes, we're going to smash Babylon. And the brethren who were teaching us reckoned it was the Catholic Church or whoever you think it might be, whatever, religious system, social system, whatever. And basically the impression was given that we're going to be going around with flame guns, you know, smashing up smashing up buildings and smashing up stained glass and incinerating people and ah, it's going to be great and there'll be ashes under the soles of our feet and very uh, extremist kind of thing which sort of you know when you're sort of wild boisterous teenager male sort of uh, is a bit attractive to some people I remember the girls were never quite so taken in or enthralled with this vision. And not all the boys were either. But uh, some of us, myself, I'm afraid, included, rather liked this idea. That when the Lord comes, oh, yay, you know, then you've got free reign. It's going to be like a sort of an arcade shooting game where you can go and shoot them and bash them and it's going to be great. Just got to wait a little bit and Jesus comes back and yay. This is totally wrong. This is not... The God, the Father, that is revealed in the Bible. The Father who hates sin but loves sinners. Who says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and that includes Babylon. This is not the Lord Jesus, who died for the sins of the world and died with the words on his lips, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Way more gracious than any of us would have been to those fellows who crucified him, you know. But, there are a few Bible passages which can be used, possibly, to support that idea. This is not the time to go through all of them, but, but I want to go through the one that's in our chapter here in Revelation 18. Because the closer you look at it, you don't see that at all. The problem is that some branches of Christianity tend to attract sort of type A personalities. People who are angry. People who are basically angry and want to express that anger and they see in hardcore right-wing Christianity a, a path for the expression of that anger. And, yeah, we're going to get out and bash them. This is totally wrong. Sort out your anger. Sort out your issues and don't harness, uh, in my opinion, a, a wrong understanding of, quote, God's truth 
a, as a sort of a channel for your own natural dysfunction and your own angry young man syndromes. It's not just men, uh, women as well, can be caught up in this whole thing. And, okay, so let, let's look at it. Revelation 18, verse 20. So when Babylon gets uh, scribbled, rejoice over her. I want to read from the AV, because I think it is a bit nearer than what the NEV is. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. As if, yay, she's down, she's scribbled, yay. As if there's some pleasure in the death of the wicked. God has no pleasure in any of this. In any case, even if you reckon you're going to get such a kick out of doing this, well, this is only for a moment, because once this Babylon of sin and all that is destroyed, then we shall get on living the life of pure love, pure grace, pure gentleness, pure kindness, forever and ever and ever. So I think the fantasy about going around incinerating people who in this life you don't like, uh, I think that's pretty <laughs> very short-sighted. Uh, because anyway, that's only just at this point of judgment when the Lord comes. Now, when you look at scripture, you're looking at something from God. And as with anything from God, nature, for example, or his creation, the closer you look, the more beautiful it is, and the more beauty you see, and the more depth, and the more profundity. If you look at anything made by man, and you ratchet up the microscope and you analyze it, metaphorically or maybe literally, the image breaks up and is not so pretty and beautiful at all. You analyze anything to do with God and it gets more profound. So I want to analyze this verse on that basis. Well, I, I, I'm going to make two points. One is based on Greek, what I think the Greek text here actually says, and the other is simply comparing scripture with scripture. And what I'm going to say, I've, I've read every commentary on Revelation, but all the ones I've looked at don't say this, so it is for me to suggest this to you and for you to uh, accept it or not. Right, so, 20. Rejoice over her, blah blah, because <clears throat> God has avenged you on her. I don't I'll give you a sort of New Testament Greek for dummies lesson, but I'll just tell you that on her. He has avenged you on her. Ek her. Ek. What does that mean? It means out of. And you have it in verse 4. Come out of her, my people. Ek her. Ek definitely means out of. You have it, for example, in the record of the baptism of the Lord Jesus. When he had come up, ek, the water, out of the water. Philip, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, baptized by Philip. When he had come up out of, ek, the water. And it's the same here. Come out of her, ek, her. And you've got exactly the same used here. Because God has avenged you ek her. God has avenged you out of her. There must be a connection between ek her in verse 20 and ek her out of her in verse 4. Come out of her, my people. God has avenged you out of her. Well... You then start scratching your head and looking again at those Greek words and thinking what it can mean. And here is my suggestion. God has avenged you who came out of her. Rejoice over her, you heaven, epi, her. It's as if this is all going on on earth, but up in heaven, there is God and, and his people, the Jerusalem that is from above, heavenly Jerusalem, God's people, etc., Rejoicing over her, epi her, looking down here on earth. And they say, God has avenged you who came out of her. Well, I said that that is my take on the Greek. 
that they say, well, God had they rejoicing because God has avenged you who came out of her. And my, my second point is, compare scripture with scripture. Where do you read in the Bible, in the words of Jesus, because revelation is the words of Jesus, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Where in the words of Jesus do you read the idea of rejoicing in heaven? Where does Jesus talk about rejoicing in heaven? Well, I believe you got it. Luke 15. A couple of times he says this. Twice. That there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. Joy in heaven, rejoicing in heaven, is over repentance. That's what makes heaven glad. Uh, I don't, you know, God does not rejoice, it seems to me, that, ah, oh, yeah, great, we scribbled the great whore, yeah. Just see a, see a torture, see a struggle, yay. Ah, oh, how happy I am. No. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So, on the level of the Greek text, and on the level of simply comparing that with Luke 15, joy and rejoicing in heaven is over repentance. And there, God's people, as it were, in the heavenly Jerusalem, heaven, God, the angels, etc., the Lord Jesus, are rejoicing over you who have come out of her. So, this appeal to Babylon at 1201, come out of her, she's fallen, come out, you're on borrowed time, you're living after midnight, you're living after the time has finished, and somebody does, some do, whoa, and there's joy in heaven, right, they're out, okay, skip all the rest of them, right, that, I suggest, is how we should read it. So, how does this apply to the bread and wine? That you see again God's desire to save. That for him, human repentance is absolutely critical and such a joy to him. And what he wants, well, you and I aren't perfect, right? We're weak, another thing. We keep saying to God, oh, God, please forgive me for doing this. I've done it again. Please forgive me. I know, you say that with tears in your eyes, but in, in heaven there's joy. Over a guy standing at a bus stop, standing out there at a tram stop, waiting for the number five tram, smitten by it in his conscience. God, please forgive me. Yay! Joy in heaven. See, that's how it is. That's joy in heaven. So, this is the huge comfort, is it not? The absolutely huge comfort to all of us that God and his son, the father and son, are looking for us to repent and absolutely want us to repent and love to save. Jesus died to save. Yahushua, your salvation, died with ups, upheld, opened arms to beckon us to himself. I want you. Come to me. I am meek and lowly of heart. I'm a humble guy. Don't be frightened. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to have a go at you. I'm a humble guy. I'm not arrogant. I'm going to stand over you and say, oh, you this, that, the other. No. Come, just come to me, can you? This is him. Meek and lowly in heart. And my last point is in verse 13. We have this great big list of the wealth of Babylon. It starts in verse 11, they're pretty long verses. All the things they traded in are listed here. And then verse 13, it finishes off. And slaves and souls of men. Slaves, that's the idea. But it is repeated three times. The slaves and bodies of men. They could have just said, and slaves. But three times the point is made, slaves and bodies of men, well of course the, the, the slaves were people were men, were people, it's kind of axiomatic, but it's laboured three times the bodies of men is alluding to the slave markets in Rome where they would look at the body of the, uh, of the slave can he do this, prod him here go and run, run over there for, you know, how fast can you run 
or you know, treating you know, men as animals, really. Why this triple emphasis on slavery? Well, I think it's partly because the huge wealth of Rome, which in the first instance is Babylon, in the first century context, I think it was Jerusalem and Rome, but the wealth of Rome was built on slaves. It was built on slavery. Let's be clear about this. And there is a lot of evidence from outside the scriptures that the majority of Christians in the first century were slaves. It, it, Christianity was mocked by its critics as a religion of women and women, kids and slaves. That was what it was mocked as. And when you look at the text itself of the New Testament, I think you see that as well, because there's a lot of stuff that's directed to slaves. And also, a lot of the metaphors that are used are metaphors out of slavery. For example, the whole idea of redemption, of purchasing us to himself of changing masters in Romans 6. All this is from the slave market, Romans particularly. And why, why would Romans have so much language about redemption, buying somebody out of slavery, or buying this slave from this master, and then he's got to serve this master who bought him? And of course, the, the price paid was the, the blood of, of the Lord Jesus. Why? Well, when you come to the end of Romans, there's a whole list of people whom Paul greets. And a lot of those people who are named, a lot of those names are slave names. Not all of them, but a lot of them are slave names. And you, you see greetings to the, how, to the believers in the household of so-and-so. Well, that means the household of some rich guy were his slaves. And the greetings are often not to the actual man, who is the, the head of house, but to his household, yeah, his slaves. That's why Romans is full of slavery language. You come to Revelation, it's full of it as well. So it's not surprising here that there is this triple emphasis at the end of all this list on slavery. It's what's called end stress, where actually the most important thing is put at the end of the list. And it's put three times here, as if, yep, I know that it's all built on slavery. And I know that you, who are slaves, are actually free. This is why the book of Revelation talks so often about the Lord Jesus as Lord and Master. Because he is your true master. You've got a master who bosses you around, says, do this, do that. And you have to do it. But you're doing it unto your true master who is the Lord Jesus. It's why it's so often we read about in Revelation about those who keep or are obedient to the commandments of their Lord. Those who keep his commands, who obey. I don't think that means that obedience and sort of ticking boxes is so critical. Of course, it's not unimportant. But it's not salvation by works either, nor is it salvation by obedience. It's salvation by faith through grace. But I think all that emphasis on, on you are the ones who are obedient to his commands is in this context of slavery. That, because obedience was the big word, the big concept for a slave. I must be obedient to my master. Do this. You're not obedient enough. You weren't obedient quickly enough. Well, yeah. I'm obedient to him. He is my master. That, I think, is the point. Now, this all has a lot of relevance, actually, to us. Because although we do not have slavery in this institutionalized sense that they had it in the first century, actually capitalism, socialism for that matter, is not far off. It's not far off this. Creating a slave class. Because the whole wealth of capitalism, of Western society, or not just Western society, a lot of societies, all societies, is built on the slave class. You know, I, I'm afraid Marx had a few things right in his observations upon life. And it's true. 
the, the whole the masses are a slave class. And this idea of, you know, I'm stuck in this position. I have got debts and I must do this job. I must not lose my job. I must keep in with my employer to meet my debts and what I've got to pay for my house, kids, or whatever it might be. I am stuck in this position. I have no freedom. I must do this. I have to go to work, even if I feel sick, because no, there'll be trouble. I must be there. I must do this. This is all a form of slavery, creating wealth for someone above us. And I'm not saying, you know, break free, actually you can't. But the whole message, yeah, is for us. That, no, there is, yeah, you go through the motions and all that stuff, but you are doing it as unto the Lord. Even people who appear to have made it, who are very wealthy and have got great careers and houses and holiday houses, they're actually in the same position. Actually, they're in the same position because that's all a treadmill. And you can't get off it Not very easily. They're still actually enslaved within the system that they are in. They might be a bit above you in the system, but they're still enslaved in it. Now, this is where all these metaphors become so powerful that through the blood of Jesus, at whatever point you are in the system, you have been bought out of that and your allegiance is to another Lord and to another Master and all that you do, the motions of what you do, whether in a high-flying career or working on an assembly line in a factory, all the same. Uh, believe me, it's all the same. But all of that can be done to him as unto the Lord, the Lord, the Master, who is him who loved us and gave his life for us, so that through his blood we are bought out of that slavery. Now, there is a, a slight nuance here in Revelation when you start to read it from the point of view of how would have this sounded to a slave. When you come to Babylon, Babylon has got a mark on her forehead. Okay? And she puts her mark on her followers. Whereas the followers of the Lamb have his name on their foreheads. So there's a contrast. The idea of being sealed, that they are sealed on their forehead, we are told in Revelation 7, Revelation 14, we are sealed with his name on our forehead. That's also an allusion to slavery, but a slightly unusual one. Although every slave in the first century would have picked it up immediately. Slaves generally were not branded on their foreheads with their master's name. No, not generally. But they were sometimes. Why? When? If they tried to run away and were caught and came back to the household and they agreed that they were sorry and they wanted to stay, they were branded on their forehead with the name of their owner. Just to remind everybody that I am not a free man. I belong to Lucius Paulus or whoever. I, I belong to my master. It's on my forehead. I'm not gonna be sold to anybody else. I'm gonna run away. If I run away again, you can all see who I belong to. So this was unusual for the slave to be branded with the master's name on the forehead, but it was done in, the, in this specific case. And I think, by the way, that is what Paul means when he says, I bear in my body the brand, the branding of the Lord Jesus. He's saying, look, I, I was called and I ran away, but I came back and I've got his mark on me for good. So the, so the servants, the slaves of Jesus in Revelation have got his brand, his seal, his name on their foreheads. Yeah, why? Because we all have been disobedient. We have all run away and come back and said, yeah, I'm not much of a slave. I'm really sorry. Can I please stay in your house forever? I promise I'm not going to go anywhere else. Put your name, please, branded on my forehead. So don't sell me to nobody else. You can't sell me to anyone else now. I've got your name on my forehead. I'm going to serve you till I die. 
and bury me, please, in the backyard of the villa, where I shall faithfully serve you with all my power and strength until I'm an old guy. And uh, when I'm gone, just bury me, please, in your villa. I'm not, I promise you, Lord, I'm, Master, I'm not going to run anywhere. I've got your name. Put my name, please, on, on my forehead. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not a very good servant, and I'm very sorry about what I did. But I'm going to stay, and I want to stay. Okay. You sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay. And we are those. That's us. Again and again in, in the scriptures, you, you are not called to perfectionism. You're called to recognise your sins and to face how you are. But to give yourself to the most loving Lord and Master that you can want. Put your name, Lord, on my forehead. I ain't going anywhere now. I'm going to sin, I'm going to fail, but I ain't running away from you. <laughs> There'd be no point. I run away, I can't sell myself to anybody else, can't do anything else, everyone's going to know who I am. Yeah, I'm yours. I'm yours. And may I just serve you till my strength finishes. Um, when I can't serve you anymore, you know, just bury me in your villa. Bury me in your house. And that's where I shall abide. This is what it would have meant to the vast slave population, the large percentage of Christians who were slaves in the early church, to whom this originally was given. So then, lots of things to remember, but I think my abiding feeling out of all this is God's grace to Babylon. You know, a tenth part of the city falls, and then, only then, the rest of it. And even when Babylon's fallen, even in 11.59, come on, repent, no, she's fallen, give her something to heal her. She doesn't, she refused it. Right, 12, it's midnight, you're living after midnight, it's 12.01 now, you're more than on borrowed time, please come out. And somebody does, and God rejoices, heaven rejoices. This is the God, and this is the Lord Jesus, with whom we have to do who so desperately wants to save us. Let's take every comfort from that. Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you for this bread, which is to us the communion of the body of Christ that he gave for us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will cleanse us from all our sin and bring us into your kingdom. May we be yours, be your slaves forever and not feel that we are slaves of this world, but realise that we are your slaves, and that all that we do in the drudgery and human stuff of this life to our masters, we do unto you. Please accept that. You are the most loving Lord and Master and the very best. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you to take this cup of wine which we fully accept and understand is a double symbol. Knowing that we drink either condemnation to ourselves or we take as we believe the cup of blessing which we now bless. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will accept us into your wonderful kingdom and that we might live forever with you and with the Lord Jesus, <clears throat> our Lord and our Master. So Zion is going to win out over Babylon. We may feel quite rightly so powerless. Our system is structured at every point against us. They are bigger than us. But Babylon is fallen. The whole thing is fallen. Think of the hymn. Strong were thy foes, but the power that hath saved thee was mightier far. Shout, for the foe is destroyed that enslaved thee. The oppressor is vanquished, and Zion is free. The oppressor is vanquished, and Zion is free.